Are you dreaming of that perfect job? Maybe you're still trying to figure out what it is that you really want to do in life. Have you been stuck in the same job for years and feel like you're being passed over for that promotion? Are you simply going through the motions, living your life for the weekend? Do you tense up before a job interview or can't figure out why you aren't getting hired for the jobs you want? And is there even a way to work from home and move away from the nine to five hours? You see, we spend the majority of our adult lives at work. So it should be a place that you enjoy being at, an environment to thrive in, a place where you feel valued. And yet I'm betting for a lot of you, you don't see it this way. Let's kickstart this year with some inspiration, motivation, and the know-how to land the job you want in the field that you want, earning the income you desire. Now, this podcast is not about manifesting that perfect job, but actually rather knowing the ins and outs of the workforce, what employers are looking for, what mistakes you might be making on the resume, what makes the better first impression, and the list actually goes on and on. So joining us today is Recruiting in Motion partner, Sari Cantor. Now, Sari has spent more than 20 years engaging people across the country to find the job they are meant to be doing while working with companies to find the right talent to fill their spots. She's been able to assist companies both in the private and the public sectors in their hiring practices and their retention strategies. So whether you're the boss doing the leading and the hiring or the employee looking to make your mark, we've got you today. We've got your list and tips and strategies and that resume ready to go. So welcome to Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, you can always head to extensionmarketing.com. Hi, Sari. Hi, Leanne. (laughs) So nice to have you in this environment. I love being here with you. Thanks for having me. Sari and I have spent years doing uh, segments on CTV Morning Live. We had like five minutes for you to like list off like the top seven things, the top five things you need to know. Like we had like a list and we had to get through it really quickly. We did. And it never felt like we had enough time and we were trying to jam in 101 subjects into five minutes or less. I know. So how excited are you? We have like an hour to talk about this. (laughs) I'm so excited. I should actually mention that there's there's definitely a comfort level between the two of us. We have known each other since high school. Uh, Our communities, uh, you know, are, are flowing in and out with our kids and the camp and friends. So we go back. Our relationship spans a little bit more than just the professional level. It does. We have a history. There's a history. We both also went to the same high school, I should mention, because I, I just said to you, oh my God, it's the 50th reunion. I just, I'm actually going to be doing some some hosting and, and seeing for the weekend, but 50 years for our high school. And you're just like, I just found out. Well, I, yes, I, I just found out ironically from one of my old teachers from the high school who had reached out uh, to have me come in and speak to a group of retired teachers. Really? Really. And so he had mentioned it to me and said, look, at you know, we're having a 50 year anniversary. It's a big to do. We're gathering everybody together who is at Robert Borden High School, as you and I can both, well, as I can appreciate mm-hmm. now, my my son isn't at Robert Borden High School. Does that mean he's included in the 50 years? I don't know. Let's hope not. Not, but yeah, no, it's a great opportunity for, for to find out where people landed and where they I ended know. up. I I loved the school. I loved my years at Strawberry Borden. And for those of you, you know, some people are here in Ottawa and know exactly what we're talking about. People who are in the states, you know, everyone has their fondness and of their alumni of their high school. It for me when I was there, like Sandra O oh mm-hmm. was our head girl. Like we have had some really cool people. Uh, go through the high school but I know the teacher that you're talking about because I know you mentioned Mr. Taller and anyone who you know like that's like a like scary business like if especially if you wanted to get into the business world like you had to go through him and it's funny because you know you've arrived when it doesn't seem so scary to talk to him anymore (laughs) (laughs) he actually came into the studio uh for there was an interview and all of a sudden I was like oh my god Mr. Taller is here right you go back to being a kid you know what you really do but and and it's funny because you say everybody looks upon their high school and their alumni as something to be proud of you and I can both appreciate we're born and raised in Ottawa Mm -hmm. and so you know being part of this bigger community, knowing the community, having small communities amongst the bigger community, um, and then watching everybody come back to this community. It's kind of special. It's kind of special, exactly. It really is. Okay, so when we were chatting, and I, I mentioned to you wanting to do this podcast, I wanted to do it around this time of the year because I think it falls into, right? People are going, I want to get healthier, I want to lose weight, I want to become more motivated, but I think sometimes in that, 
where you spend the majority of your time, which is at work, also comes into play of wanting to be better, of wanting to do more, of maybe kind of going through the thought process that maybe this is the year for change. Do you sense that? Do you start to feel that uh, even in the office or with companies or people coming to you? Well, I think that's a normal feeling when we get to the end of the year. And we have time off and we come back to work. And really during that time off, we have time to reevaluate. But we come back to work and we realize, ugh. Right. It it just we're not we don't come back with the same inspiration that maybe we did the prior years or when we come back from a vacation. And so we set a goal of, you know, whether it's a resolution or otherwise, that we want to make a change in 2020. The problem is, is that that's a really broad statement. You know, that's like saying I want to lose weight and just not really having a game plan of what it's going to take, whether it's healthy eating or whether it's a um, better workout regime. It's the same thing with job search. It's the same thing with wanting to execute on that kind of massive change in your life. I want a job. Great. There are so many things we need to do and small successes that we can celebrate along the way with the big prize at the end being the new job. You have been in this industry for so long. How many people are truly happy in their job? (laughs) What do you get in that sense of of where we spend the most time? Well, you know what? It's funny. I think over time, and I've been doing this, like you said, for 20 years, so I've seen different economic climates. And sometimes it's associated with the economic climate um, in terms of, of their longevity, their happiness, what makes them happy. As I was saying to you before we went on air, um, you know, people outgrow their companies because they change over different phases in life. You go through different things in your 20s than you do in your 30s than you do in your 40s. And different circumstances will change that. Therefore, you have you want different things out of your career. You have a different tolerance and appetite for what goes on around you as you get older and you mature and you see things through a different lens. Companies, by nature, because there's lots of people, sometimes are harder to change. And so you change quickly. And so it's hard to say how many people are truly happy. I think their motivation changes. I think they can find happiness, hopefully find happiness at certain periods in their career. No job is perfect. No Mm -hmm. career is perfect. But it has to satisfy certain needs at certain times to what I would consider make you happy. It's interesting that you said that because I think for change individually, is a really hard thing to do, right? Yep. To even change your own habits, your own behaviors, you know, your own way of thinking. So, right, if you take it as an individual how hard it is, how hard it would be to change a culture or the way something happens on a much larger scale. Well, but it could be little things, Leanne. You, in your circumstance, you go from, you know, a, 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 just a, an empty nest to having children, right? And all of a sudden, circumstances change where maybe you have other commitments and just your hours of operation, the hours you can work change, right? It could be something as simple as that. And so you don't know what it is it's going to change you but over time as an individual we grow up or at least we hope we grow up and as we grow up like I said we look around us ourselves and we we are constantly asking ourselves am I the right fit Mm -hmm. does this company still fit me do I still fit them you know am I prepared to commit for another year two years whatever it is have they accommodated my growth as I've changed have I been promoted and given different responsibility during my duration in which case there may be no reason to look for another job you mentioned right in that sentence growing up Right. Have because uh, we're growing up as we're going through things. Let's go to that first stage of growing up and the pressure on high school kids or you at that young age to to know going into university what it is that you want to study, where the field that you're in. Do you find that that sometimes where the majority of errors uh, can happen just because there's there's needing to be able to get into the system? Yes. And, and yes and no, in the sense that part of what's putting pressure on students that are going through college, university, even high school, is especially when you get to the point where you're going to university or college or considering post-secondary education, it's expensive. And so there's a lot of pressure from all of us to make sure that our kids follow pursuits that a, they want that are going to hopefully make them happy, but also play to their competencies and their strengths. And that we're, they're putting them along a path that's going to blend those two so that the, we, you see the return on your investment, or they do. Because it's often that we find students fall into a university path of A and end up halfway through crossing over to B because they just can't find that happiness that mm-hmm. you've described. They've ended up in the wrong role or the wrong career path or educational path 
and it's expensive. So I think we all kind of feel that, right? We want to make sure we're making the right decisions. And now those decisions are being made younger and they're harder to make because they're just not at a place where they're capable of making them. Having said all that, you know, here in Ottawa, we tend to have a good labor force, okay? And I think, you know, to your clients down in the U.S. where I'm less familiar, or I should say your, your listeners and across other places in the country, we are dealing with a favorable labor market. And so it is a time where people do reevaluate, am I happy where I am? Because I can move. There are jobs out there. I could be looking at something else. Somebody may pay me more, give me that job that I can't get here, or maybe closer to home because there's opportunity out there. Opportunity, maybe it's just because I'm on social media and I see this, but I see so many other people creating. Like there's more creation creation mm-hmm. of jobs and opportunities without formal education Mm -hmm. am I allowed to say that Mm -hmm. formal education people are thinking a lot more outside the box I I sense maybe it's just the feeds and the people that I follow but that that didn't originally fall into mainstream jobs like you know career opportunities like our parents said go to university so you can become like a doctor a lawyer (laughs) like they had a title right and I find that that's that doesn't exist as much. No, you know, we when we were growing up, Leanne, our parents didn't look at us and say, "Hey, you can be an influencer." Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> right? They still don't look at us. No, that way. but what's interesting is, is I often look at, at careers that I've and jobs that we've filled over the last twenty plus years, and there's jobs that we've done that that don't exist today anymore. There are jobs that do still exist today where people don't wake up in the morning and say, "Gee, I want to be this." They just don't think of it as a career anymore. And therefore, the educational path and the pursuit of those kinds of jobs don't happen. And it becomes a shortage of supply of talent. And it has to be something people fall into rather than pursue. Um, Can you give me examples? Like, what are examples of things that you know are harder to fill because people just aren't doing it? You know, things in the construction space, things in the property management space. Those kinds of jobs become harder to fill because nobody wakes up in high school and says, I want to be a property manager when I grow up. I want to work, I want to be a project manager on a construction site, less and less people are saying that because they are thinking about being influencers and digital media specialists. And so, you know what? It's funny. I was in a conversation with uh, friends the other day and they're like, gosh, if if I could just be an electrician, like a plumber, you know, these are people that are still needed. Absolutely. Are, that they're, you know, their services are still required. And yet, you know, there's fewer of them. And so they're able to charge like a crazy amount of money so that we can get basic services done. Absolutely. That we need those people. Because people aren't thinking when they wake up anymore, that's what I want to be when I grow up. They're seeing exactly what you're seeing through social media and they're looking at different opportunities that maybe are more creative, that allow them to use their brains in different ways. And, you know, over the past few generations, one of the big changes that we've seen is, is that people don't stay in jobs anymore. You know, I was in a job for 15 years. You were in a job for a long time too. Um, that doesn't happen that often anymore. People go on to pursue different things, shorter periods of time, take greater risk because there's opportunity. They can take risk. Hmm. You took a risk. Like for you, right? We, we all go through this. I was 20 years mm-hmm. with the same. and I But I was a loyal employee, right? Like I found that that was something to be admired, mm-hmm. that I stuck with the company, that I grew with the company. I, gr- I honestly grew up mm-hmm. on television with that company. You know, you were in the similar background and and you're still in the same field. But what was it for you even getting into this line of work that you also went through a, hmm, I've grown? You know what? I fell into this job and I fell into this line of work. And I'll bite I'd admit today that I probably didn't know what I was walking into on the first day. But but I'm really glad somebody gave me a chance. And I spent 15 years learning from some really great people and, you know, understanding what it meant to deliver a strong client experience, understand what it meant to understand the motivation behind candidates' job search. I was given amazing opportunities to work with you through CTV and get to meet you and or get to meet your team and continue that relationship when I left my last organization. And we did a lot of public and I got to do a lot of public speaking. So I got to see a lot of other people's journeys and, and build that network over time. But as I just described, you know, I went through the same journey that you went through and that there's lots of your listeners have gone through, which is, you know, I recognize that spending 15 years and starting somewhere at 23 and ending there at 37, 38 years old, you're not the same person. I walked out of university and had a great opportunity. And I left there as somebody who was who looked at my skill set and thought, what else can I do? 
maybe I was meant to do more or something different or have a little bit more creativity, as you described, within the confines of what my competencies really were and use that as an opportunity to, to leverage my skill set in a different way and become more entrepreneurial that I couldn't do working under a big corporate umbrella. It's a scary move, though. Did you go? I, oh, we've had this chat because I'm like this entrepreneurial world. <laughs> it, sucks. it can suck the life out of you, right? It's, it's a very different mindset. Yes. To go from working. And, and so let's talk about that sure. for people, right, who have been working for organizations and, and are sitting there going, I, I think I can do this. I want to take this leap of faith. There's a, a way different mindset working for a massive organization to working on your own. So it's interesting. It depends on what it is that you want to do. Mo- making a career move doesn't mean you have to move jobs com- or companies. Gosh, sorry, not companies, but it doesn't mean you have to take the entrepreneurial route. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's a plunge. It's a different okay, mindset. You know what? I'll tell you something. Had there been more television stations here, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or more shows or different hours, I, I would have, I loved the industry yeah. that I was in. I loved it. There's just, there was nowhere left to go. And and that's why, Leanne, when you say, when I look online and I see through social media all of the different avenues that people are creating, you've hit the nail on the head. Sometimes we got to create opportunities for ourselves. And that's really where I ended up, which was, you know, I really loved what I do for a living. I do. I love meeting people. I love talking to people. Okay, I introduced you. How, would, how do you explain what it is that you do? Oh, God. You know what? I... I assist people with their job search. I take a lot of pride. Like a headhunter? Would, would I call you a headhunter? Yeah, but I'd like to think that most of my clients wouldn't necessarily yeah. look at me as a, as a traditional headhunter, not in the traditional sense that you would consider it. I, I think as I get older, I'm probably not very good at the sales side that's required to be a headhunter. But over the 20 years that I've been doing this, I've worked with some really great companies. And I've placed some fantastic people that have gone on to other jobs and, you know, kind of packed me up with their box when they move from one company to the next and they take my card with them. Um, So I've been fortunate over 20 years to build that network. And the companies that I've gotten to know and I've worked with are, you know, they're loyal to me as much as I am to them. Um, They've given me an opportunity as an entrepreneur. But my advice to people who are on that cusp, you know, first of all, you have to consider what exactly am I going to do? For me, I had a skill set. I had a competency. I had skills. I knew how to recruit. I knew how to develop clients. I knew how to treat clients. But more importantly, I knew how to treat job seekers. I spent a lot of time understanding um, what motivates people, you know, what they like in other recruiting firms, what they don't like. I spent time understanding from companies, you know, their experiences with other recruiting firms, recruiting firms before I plunged into running my own business. And really understood if I can kind of squeeze some space for myself out of an industry that was pretty mature. You talk about the job seekers, you know, yes. like working with all these job seekers. What seems to be a common trait? What what do you constantly see when someone's walking in as the job seeker? So it depends on their phase. If there's somebody who has recently been laid off or is really not happy in their current circumstance um, and they've been looking for work for a little while, they feel pretty beaten down. The funny thing about job search is, is I often describe it to be like dating. Okay, you when you're dating online with somebody, it's kind of like when you throw your resume at a job at a job posting. And if you go out on a first date and you feel like it went really well, you feel really good. But if they don't call you back, you don't feel so good. And then you pick yourself up and you go back online and repeat the same thing. Well, job search is the same when you go on an interview and you don't have success and you repeat and do the same thing. You don't feel like you're having success. And so we could really bring you down it really can bring you down there's people who come in and and, you know they're down and out because it's hard it's hard to build up you need a high level of confidence to win an interview but it's counterintuitive to rejection which is you get a lot of when you're doing when you're looking for work I love the comparison to dating it's a lot like dating we can I can and let's be realistic usually your profile pic you've really kind of it's like the best picture you've ever <laughs> taken, right? Like you're pointing out the highlights, which is the same too with your resume. There's right? a like, lot of similarities oh, wow. between okay. dating because they because both need a high level of confidence. Both you're putting you're putting out the a persona and a part of you, but not all of you. And the goal of a first date, which is the same as the goal of an interview, isn't necessarily to to want to go out with the person again. You just want them to call. Right. It's fine if you say no, thank you. Just like if somebody calls you back from an interview and says, hey, we'd like to bring you back for a second interview or we'd like to offer you the job. You're okay saying no. But if they don't call you back, you feel stung. Right. And so the same thing with dating. And so picking yourself up and recognizing that sometimes it's not really about you. 
especially in the interview processes. You're dealing with com- with managers and HR people who understand their corporate culture, and sometimes they're doing you a favor by not letting you fall into the wrong job. Because as you interview, they may really like you, but you just don't fit with what they need or their culture or the pace or anything mm-hmm. that they can't hire you. So finding small successes, like I said from the onset, and finding little things that you can feel good about along the way um, can teach you how to have success further down the road. So I mentioned, you know, looking good for that profile picture and the same thing for a resume. Can you give us a couple of tips that you know right off the bat? People make mistakes on their resume or things that you would suggest that they add? Like, what are some of those critical components? Well, I think the most obvious one, and it's, it is obvious, but it doesn't happen often enough, is people need to spell check and grammar check their resume. I think there's so often where we get a resume, and if I just put it through our basic spell check, we'll come up with so many errors or few errors or or different languages, especially if you speak two languages. Um, So, you know, just the basic of making sure that it represents the professionalism that you want. The other thing is, is that all experience is good. So I do a lot of work with new immigrants who come to this country, and sometimes they don't have Canadian work experience. And they often say, well, I don't have that Canadian experience, but I do this vol- this kind of volunteer work. So getting all of the relevant skills that you have on there so that people can have a full understanding of who Leanne is or who the job seeker really is and what they can contribute um, is, is valuable. You know, I think the other thing is, is that people sometimes assume that that language is the same. So, you know, they might come in and have a title at one company in a different province, different country even, and they come here and they assume that all of that is synonymous here when it's not. And so making sure that you research the kind of jobs you're looking for and how do they present and what kind of verbiage do they use, and then take that exact same resume and make sure it's on LinkedIn because those words again become searchable. And make sure that you have the same profile, the same chronology, everything, so that when somebody gets your resume and they go put that name into that search engine, they can pull you up with the great profile pic you described. Okay, I know you just mentioned LinkedIn. You're a big, <clears throat> big proponent of using LinkedIn. I am, I am. I, uh, the purpose of LinkedIn is to be a social media, it's a social network, mm-hmm. right? It's a medium that we use for for professional networking um, specifically. So while Facebook we tend to use to keep in touch with family and friends and go back to our high school days, that's not what LinkedIn is for. People who connect through LinkedIn, if done properly, which is a big if, um, have the opportunity to directly connect with hiring managers, with people that work in your field, with people that are ha- have pr- prospective business relationships, people, even people you just want to connect with because they have a skill set that you, and you have a question. But it allows you to interact with people in a way that isn't intrusive. You're not catching somebody in the middle of the day calling them on the phone when they're not expecting it anymore. Um, and it's acceptable, if done properly, to engage with people that you may not know as long as you explain to them why I'm reaching out to you. Okay. Emphasize done properly. What's, right. What's not done properly? Well, so you, every time you go and engage with somebody on LinkedIn, you get the standard, hi, I'd like to add you to my LinkedIn network. That doesn't explain to the person on the other end why they're receiving this, especially if I don't know you. So that's great that you want to add to me to your network, but why? So in a lot of cases, I do a lot of recruiting through LinkedIn. So I'm engaging people all the time that we may not know. And my... Entry point is always, you know what, I use that same box that allows me to add that note, which is essentially a replacement for what the traditional cover letter really was. And I can say, hi, you know what, I found your profile on LinkedIn. Um, I have a job at ABC Company. Your profile looks like a good match. Would you be interested in speaking further? If you're somebody who's looking for work and you realize there's a job at ABC Company, You can go and take ABC Company, put that into your LinkedIn profile, run that search, pull up the manager that you might be reporting into, and send them the same note and say, hi, you know what, I found your profile on LinkedIn. Your company looks really great. I don't know if you're looking to hire a marketing coordinator, but if anything should come up in your team, just add me to your network for future consideration. Doesn't that seem a little bit more professional, a little bit more engaging, and quite frankly, a little bit more intimate than just saying, I'd like to add you to my network? And you're not even saying that. LinkedIn's doing that and you're just having to sit there. And sit, connect. Right. So always you're saying send that, send that personal note. Always. Look at job search somewhere over the last 15 years has gone from being what used to be a very intimate process 
to a very unintimate process. When I started in this industry in the late 90s, we had no computers. You faxed in your resume or you dropped it off, right? We didn't have email. Nobody sent it in. Nobody texted in anything. Um, 20 years later, the intimacy of coming in and dropping off your resume has changed. The intimacy of sitting down and writing a cover letter with thought has changed because we have technology. So to bring it back into the fold and to make a process more intimate and not having to rely on applicant tracking systems and search words and CRM systems to do those matches for you, go find the people. Tell them why you're connecting with them. And they may not have a job for you today, but if you all of a sudden see a job posted, you now have someone you can circle back to. Maybe they know somebody who's looking to hire. But when I come back and I tell you to celebrate the small successes, if you're really looking for work and you set a goal for yourself of, okay, you know what? I'm going to go online. I'm going to find three to five new people a day, just three to five. It might take you 15, 20 minutes except if you work in the TV industry. Um, but anywhere else, if it, it might be three to five people a day. So by the end of the week, you've reached out to 15 to 25. By the end of the month, you've broadened your network to 60 to 100 people. It's a lot of people to reach out to in a city. Our, I don't want to use the word desperate, but sometimes people just need to hear. You haven't been doing <clears throat> the background work. You haven't been doing, you know, you haven't trained properly for what it is that you're hoping to get. Leanne, most of the people who come into my office, the biggest challenge isn't that they can't find a job. It's that they don't know how. And so what they've been doing is indeed post my job, I apply and I wait. And then I rinse and repeat every day until I'm banging my head because I'm not getting a response. And that works sometimes. I don't know what the percentage is, but, you know, it, it, I think... I hear more stories of people not finding work and getting frustrated than those that truly do. So, you know, you want to take control of your job search. You want to feel like you're in control of your job search. And by constantly building that network is something you truly can control. And when people come into my office and they say, I can't find a job or there's no jobs, my response is, is we're dealing with a city, especially here in Ottawa, where we have a four, four and a half percent unemployment rate relative to the rest of the country. Even across the country, we're dealing with unemployment rates that just recently dropped. So we're almost as close to full employment as we really can be. Sometimes it's just about putting hiring manager and job seeker together so that they can find each other. Because I don't exist and my career doesn't exist and my competition doesn't exist if people could truly find each other. You also have it, though, from like companies. I mean, you see the desperation coming from those that are coming in going, there's no jobs. <laughs> there's no jobs out there. And then you have companies that are coming to you saying, we just can't find, there just doesn't seem to be anyone that can fit what we're looking for. Like there's frustration, mm -hmm. I would think, on both ends. So it's interesting from the company perspective because there's a few different things that have been happening. Um, it was not too long ago, I know there, uh, CBC had an article on ghosting in the workplace. So, you know, it's not just companies hiring and fighting to retain the people they have. When there's turnover or there's, they, they want to grow, attracting new talent becomes an issue. And then even if they have tracked the new talent, how do I ensure those people show up on the first day, right? I mean, there's a whole journey that people have to go through now to bring people in and, and they can't come in quick enough. I mean, whether you're an IT professional or you work, work in finance, or you work in HR, you're an engineer, it doesn't really matter. But I do believe that people hire people. Companies don't hire resumes and job seekers don't go work for job, for job postings. And so if we could just find a way, if you're a hiring manager and you have a need to hire somebody who's, let's say, an accountant, and you can't, you're waiting for your HR department to do the work for you and they're looking and just can't find it. They're not getting the applicants that they're hoping to get. And all of a sudden, somebody lands in your LinkedIn account and says, hey, Leanne, I'm moving here from Halifax, and I've got six years of accounting. I found your company. I see that you're growing. It really interests me. You as the manager, don't you have the most vested interest in either responding to this person, putting them in touch with the right person, bringing them in? And what, that's why that intimacy becomes important. And hiring managers being engaged with their HR departments to make sure that they both and everybody has access to the best talent. And sometimes we have a wish list and sometimes we have to tick less boxes. And, you know. But the, the more boxes that you're not able to tick off, mm -hmm. the more I think you're draining yourself of trying to live that 
you know, of, you're, you're trying to find the job that ticks off the most boxes, right? Mm-hmm. To feel fulfilled. But sometimes finances, mm-hmm. money, you know, you need to pay the bills. Those often leapfrog ahead of finding pure joy. They do. And so there's a way to bridge that gap. And I, I, like I said, I work with a lot of people who come here from all over the world. And that's usually their biggest comment, which is, I just need to find work. And I often say to them, you know, there's because the unemployment rate is so low, it has caused a huge need in that contract and temporary side of things. Because the only people that compete for for contract and temporary work are people who aren't working. And when you're dealing of a, you know, if we look at Ottawa as an example, and the city of Ottawa is a million people, we just hit a million people, and our unemployment rate is, you know, four and a half percent, then that's telling us that there's 45,000 people in this city that are not working. Of those 45,000 people, there's people who don't want to work, but are still, or not actively looking, but are still qualified in those, or, you know, considered in those, in those statistics. And if you then say to yourself, well, I'm an accountant, how many of those, that 45,000 people are accountants. And you realize that there may be very few, maybe three to 4,000. So if you're not working right now and you can't find your dream job or it's taking you a little bit longer, there is nothing stopping you from putting yourself again in front of companies, whether it's through LinkedIn, using recruiting firms, or just giving yourself opportunity to say, hey, look, I'm open to contract work. Because those are jobs that you'll actually never see posted right? You'll never see them advertised. You'll never see them come through LinkedIn or Indeed unless they're, you know, 12 month maternity leave. But sometimes somebody might have work for three or four months and they may have a new budget. They have, they're planning for events coming up in the spring or summer. They're going through year end. There's a whole bunch of reasons why somebody may just have interim work. So if it does take you longer and you do feel like you need to solve for an immediate solution, realize that there's not a lot of competition for that short-term contract work. Okay. So we've gotten our resume off, with proper spelling, yes. check the list, and knowing where our value is. We go in for the interviews. Yes. Sometimes like, so you can have someone that's really confident, they're good to go, and then you have someone who's like, their palms are like sweating, they're sweating through everything, they're like almost in a panic attack. Yep. How do you how do you speak to those people? How What do you suggest? Because there's a lot of common mistakes people are making as soon as they walk mm-hmm. in for the interview. So there's a few things. I like to talk a lot about what I like to call the anatomy of an interview. Um, And before I get into that, there's two things to consider, right? There's the verbal part of an interview and there's the nonverbal part of an interview. So the anatomy of an interview talks to the verbal side of what an interview is all about. And, you know, people often say to me, and really most recently my sister called me with the same challenge, look at, I can't find a job, I'm interviewing and and I'm just, I'm not very good. And in fact, she gave me the best line. She said, I walk into an interview and she said, I tell them that I'm not very good at interviews. And I'm like, but that's what it's for. So why don't we talk about how you're preparing for those interviews? And maybe next time you'll win and not come up with the excuse. But she's automatically walking in, starting with a negative. Exactly. And so instead, what happens... I I see that she's thinking she's being honest. I'm honest and authentic and I don't interview well. Right. But it's... It's not going in your favor. It's not going in your favor. And most of the anxiety around that I'm not doing well and I'm not prepared is because you don't know what to expect. There's always that fear of the unknown. What are they going to ask me? And so the anatomy of the interview follows what I consider four steps. And if you plan for the four steps, then typically, not always, but typically, most of the questions that are asked during the interview will tend to fall into one of those those four buckets, let's say. So the first one is really to understand the company. How many times do people go into interviews and they haven't researched the company? I know this seems obvious again, just like spelling and grammar, but many people think that they could just go in and wing it. But they get questions like, you know, Leanne, why are you here for this interview? What is it about our company that you're interested in? The questions can come at you in whatever variety and with whatever verbiage they choose. But the reality is what they're looking for is, is, have you done your homework on what this organization is and what the job is that we have available? The second part to it is the technical piece. Can you actually do the job that we need you to do? And so when people go through job descriptions, the top part of every job description lays out the, the responsibilities. If you go through your resume and you go through that 
responsibility portion and you prepare examples of where you've done each of those jobs so that when they start asking you questions, because you know they will want to make sure you can do their job, you have the examples with you that you've already prepared. It's okay to bring paper. It's okay to bring examples. It's okay to bring notes, but you'll have everything already there so you don't have to think on your feet. Oh yes, I've done that, but where did I do it before? Where did I use that system or how did I use that technology? It's all written out for you. The third piece to it is, okay, Leanne, do you fit within our organization? And people always say, well, how do I know if I fit? At the bottom of every job description, it gives you the qualifications. It tells you, you know, what kind of education you need, how many years of experience, what kind of technology you may need. But it also gives you the soft skills. I need somebody who can work in a fast pace. I need somebody who can communicate well. I need somebody who can prioritize. Those are buzzwords. If you don't fit those buzzwords, you're probably applying to the wrong job. But if you do apply to, if you do, um, if those buzzwords do apply to you, then you, again, you want to prepare examples. This is where I've had to work in an environment where they had tight deadlines. This is where I've had to work in a collaborative team environment. This is where I've had to work autonomously. And so you're not, again, being forced to think on your feet. And those questions may come to you again in the forms of what are your strengths and weaknesses? My strengths are I'm a good time, I'm good at managing my time, I'm good at dealing with tight deadlines, and here's why. The last question, the last bucket is, Leanne, do you have any questions for me? And everyone always says, no, we're good, right? I'm, I'm done. This was good. But if you actually just prepare four or five questions, and in the event that they answer all of your questions, at the very least, you can show them your notes and say, you know what, this was a great interview. Thank you. You actually answered all my questions. Are there any gaps in this interview or anything I didn't answer for you or any concerns that maybe we, that we can address before I leave? What kind of questions would you want that person asking? <clears throat> when they say at the end of the interview, do you have any questions for us? What would be good questions for that candidate to be asking the company? This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They are a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally as I've been using the Extension Marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. So it depends. I mean, they could be questions as simple as, you know, tell me a little bit about your process. Tell me about what brought you to this organization. Tell me about why the position is open. Tell me about, you know, what do you think the key success factors are for somebody in the first 30, 60 days? But in a lot of cases, those kinds of questions give you the opportunity to then give them answers. You know, we feel the, the key successes for somebody in the first 30 days are this. And you're right there to be able to say, great, this is where I've done that before. And you can, or if you, there are any gaps, great, let me just readdress that because you're there in the moment. But, you know, one of the things you don't want to ask are, so how much does this pay, right? How much, how much vacation do I get? How much vacation do I get? What are the hours? You know, those are things that I think are not necessarily appropriate for a first interview. And they're things that will come up probably later down the road. Um, a lot of times I get the question, what about compensation? What if they ask me, you know, what, what salary am I looking for? Um, my answer is always, you know, typically you don't want to have to negotiate against yourself. So as soon as you throw a dollar value out there you and you don't know what a job pays, then you may be underselling you, yourself or you may be completely pricing yourself out of this job. So when somebody comes to you and says, you know, Leanne, what kind of salary are you looking for? You can turn around and say, you know what? This was a great interview. I'm very interested in the job. What range were you looking to target? At which point they may say, we're looking to target fifty to 60000 If you're a $60,000 candidate, then you can say, great, I'd be at the upper end of your range. If you're a $50,000 candidate, you can say, great, you know what, I'd fit into that range. If you're a $70,000 candidate, you can say, great, this was a great interview. Unfortunately, I'm looking for something above that range. And if you decide you want to continue to go down this road, please feel free to call me back. Or if you want to reconsider, if you can't find what you're looking for, call me back. Oh my God, you'd be great in a job interview, Sarah. You've got this all. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Leanne? It's always easy to tell other people until you have to live right. it yourself. And, you know, part of my journey and part of my experience getting here was a lot of fact finding too. And I've spent I've spent a lot of time in interviews myself, interviewing other people. Mm-hmm. I've spent a lot of time dissecting and debriefing with clients and candidates on the kind of interviews they've gone on. Um, and I think there's a lot of things we tend to take for granted as 
as a job seeker that when you're going on an interview, we just don't think about. You know, we were. I said to you, there's two parts of, of an interview. There's the verbal side of it, right. but. There's yeah, you a, gave us the four buckets. Right. Now go into the nonverbals. Well, the other part or, of it is, is, you know, how do I look and feel? I mean, you spend a lot of time on your podcast talking about health and wellness and eating properly and feeling physically fit and mentally on your game. There's a lot of that that goes into interviewing, right? Um, waking up in the morning, having a good meal before you go to an interview so that your stomach isn't talking to you. Um, you know, practicing in front of a mirror so that you you see how other people see you. So you you can understand the, and what kind of image you're projecting, what kind of brand you're projecting. Um, you know, making sure that you're dressed and the attire you're putting on is something that, you know, is you feel good in. People always say, do I need to wear a suit or how formal do I need to get? You need to feel good. If you feel good in jeans and that doesn't meet the dress code of an organization, then guess what? You're never going to meet the fit in the, the organization because day one, if you can't wear jeans, you're not going to feel comfortable wearing a suit every day. So it's important that you feel good and you understand the culture and you dress to the occasion, but it's within the comfort zone that makes you still feel confident. And I see this, right? But I'm, I'm picturing now, because it makes so much sense, but I'm picturing the person who has a tough time looking themselves in the mirror and feeling good. Of course. Or, you know, and so it's like a double whammy of they don't have the confidence, they're not feeling the part, and yet they still need to go through this process and they need the job. That it's like I feel that it could feel for them like um, anxiety ridden, kind of negative feel of what it is that they need to be doing. So the other thing that's very similar to interviewing is writing an exam. We talk a lot about the similarities with dating, but the other similarity is really writing an exam. And when you're going in to write an exam and you know you haven't studied, you have a lot of that anxiety and lack of confidence that you just described. I don't know what I'm doing. And so I go into that exam and it's, you know, what I like to call, you know, verbal diarrhea. You sit there and just keep writing and writing and writing and hope that somewhere in this answer <laughs> I've put enough words in there to get a couple of marks every now and then. But I know I don't know what I should know. The interview is the same thing. In order to mitigate anxiety, we need to feel prepared, right? We need to feel like we've done the homework to be able to go and win the game or give us give ourselves a chance. Without that preparation, you have no hope of feeling good when you walk in there because the anxiety is way through the roof. But that preparation, whether it's what you wear or how you look in terms of the, the way you present yourself verbally or the preparation behind the, the answers that you want to give or the questions that you want to ask, if you feel like you go into an exam and you may not get the result, but you know you've put in the work, at least at the end of it, you walk away and say, you know what, I put in the work. Maybe I didn't get the result this time, but I know I did everything I could. We teach our kids that, mm -hmm. right? And so if you continue to perpetuate that, like I said, there is another part of this equation that we don't consider when we're the job seeker, which is there's a company there. And sometimes somebody is doing you a favor by not hiring you. I know it doesn't feel good. I know you want the job, but do you really want a job where you're going in and it doesn't fit? where you're miserable, where you can't do the job, where you're truly not set up for success. How often is that the case? Often. There's often times where people end up in jobs because, like you said, they need an income, so they're going to take the first thing that comes up. They take jobs that are really in a location that they can't really get to, and so once they get in there, they realize their commute is is not feasible. Um, they get into jobs that are paying them lower than really what their cost of living is, and they haven't taken the time to really map that out. What do I need to live? And therefore, I take less because it's the first job that, that came up. So yeah, all the time people end up in jobs that they don't that that aren't the right jobs for them. People get rejected from jobs because you're dealing with people on the other end who are professionals. They're not stupid. They get it. Their job is to find people who fit and can in just ooze their corporate culture. They can embrace it. They breathe it. They live it. And while you think you might, they are there and they're experts on knowing what should fit there. And if they're telling you that you're not, it's not personal. It's not because Leanne's a bad person. It's not because she doesn't have the right skills. It's not because she's not the right fit. It's because this job or this company may not bring out the best in Leanne. Well, hopefully people can start to incorporate a bit of that 
mindset or that shift in their thinking if they're going through this process right now that you've compared to taking an exam and dating. So I I love the analogies and and it totally makes sense. You know, you were talking about, you know, that the commute doesn't work or the hours aren't going to be feasible. There's a, a big change in people not having to sometimes do the commute because they get to work out of home and they get to make their own hours. That has been a massive change, especially maybe because we're in this government city to Mm -hmm. here, right? But I have a lot of friends that I know, you know, government hours, but they're working out of the house and they check into their computer and they make sure that they're on at a certain time. How much of a change or how much of an adaptation, how, how people had to adapt in that they're working more from home or companies are encouraging that a little bit more often? So... It's up to the individual. You know, I joke because at my office, I encourage my staff to come in or work from home. They have a choice. And yet they always come in. And they truly enjoy being around each other. And so having them in the office is fantastic, but they like the flexibility to be able to do that. Not everybody can work from home. And right. it's it's a really nice luxury to have. And everyone says, well, I can work from home. But if you're not somebody who can manage your time, manage yourself, be self-motivated, um, know when to walk away, know when to sit down and keep that discipline during the workday, then you're doing nobody a favor. Um, there's things, you know, there's ways to collaborate through video conferencing and, and teleconferencing and being part of a team without physically being in an office anymore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Leanne, it comes back to motivation. If you're somebody who, let's say, does have small kids and you want to pick up your kids at the end of the day and the only way to do that is to say, hey, I'm going to go home at or pick up my kids at four and then log on and put in the rest of my day, then it's great that a company can offer that to you. You know, that's a great way to be able to be more productive within the confines of what business hours really are. And it allows for accountability and creativity on how people manage their days. Um, I think for companies, it's a fantastic retention tool, right? For companies who want their people in the office seven, eight hours a day, it's hard to keep them because there are just times where people can't do that anymore or they don't want to do that or they have, you know, they value that time where they can go and work out or play hockey at the end of the day or be at a, a child's concert. So they, they may not want to be managed that way. But if work-life balance is, or, or flexibility to work from home is really not an issue for you, then who cares? Go find the best company. Okay, so can I go to the catch-22 of some of those companies that are like Uber – not uber the driving but like uber enthusiastic Mm -hmm. about doing everything for their employees Mm -hmm. like there's coffee and food and catering and you know video game rooms and places where they can go and lie in a hammock and work and (laughs) yeah but there's a lot like let's pretend we're in out you know in in silicon valley like you know there are these companies that have created this environment where everything is provided for their employees part of me thinks they have you there and they do all that so you don't leave They do. Those are all retention strategies, right? That's really changed over the last 15, 20 years of what we're prepared to do. And companies have done a really good job at understanding what makes their employees tick. At least they do, and they address it as best as they can. And beca- and it goes hand in hand, like I said to you, with the labor market. When you're dealing with a really tight labor market, you want to be able to keep the employees you have for as long as you can. So if it's about putting up a hammock or getting a barbecue or having a video game or bringing in coffee, those are sometimes small things to do to keep people happy. I think the really critical thing here is if you're a if you're a hiring manager or you're an HR manager, it is really having a pulse on what makes those people tick. Because sometimes I think I've seen a lot of companies that I work with, they offer their employees what they think is the sun, the moon, and the stars, but they're not actually things employees ever use, right? I mean, how many employees have, you know, benefit plans that are, you know, excessive and they get vision care and they get eye care, or sorry, uh, massage therapy and everything else, but they don't wear glasses, So what value is that to you, right? Um, They get gym memberships, but they never go to the gym. So why, you know, why don't we find or we what we have to find ways to make sure that our our workforce has an equal, um, I guess they see it as equal perks, that they see it that they're getting things that are truly making them happy and not that are being rammed down their throat because they make somebody else happy or because they've just traditionally Mm. made people happy. Um, You know, I often say pension plans are an interesting idea because, you know, in the public sector where they have a pension plan, 
It's a huge retention tool. Everyone who goes to work for the government or has worked for the government often says, I go to the government because I get my pension. But in today's day and age, people's careers are so transient. They don't stay in one job forever anymore. So if you're able to make up that contribution by moving jobs or getting raises or getting bonuses... And you're not really going to stick it out for 30 or 40 years within that organization to get that pension. Then doesn't it make it worth your while to take some risk and look at different kinds of opportunities along the way? Because that's a benefit that may not ever be a value to you. I'm going to have a lot of government workers going oh no no (laughs) no but but you know what Leanne it is and people and I don't want to miss I don't want you to misunderstand because I think it is a motivator oh no absolutely I'm saying no no I'm gonna stay because it it is such a it is such a huge what what would make it different though and difficult is like office politics or not getting along with your coworkers or being a toxic environment like how how do people maybe they like the work that they're doing but it's a really difficult environment or maybe they love the social environment of being at work and yet they're failing miserably at the actual tasks that they're supposed to be doing, right? There's, because you're spending so much time there, there's... So so I'd like to think that people that are in jobs that enjoy the social aspect but can't actually handle the responsibilities Mm -hmm. are usually not in their jobs that long, okay? I mean, or at least shouldn't be in their jobs that long. Usually people have to bring value more than just the social element to be able to retain their jobs. But, you know, there's, there's... The company as a whole, um, they want to encourage a social environment, right? They want to encourage their employees to come into work. And like you said, right off the get-go, we spend a lot of time there. So they want to encourage their company, their employees to come in and really embrace it as a family. Right. But just like it would be like in school, like there are office bullies, there are toxic relationships, there are people that don't get along. So like that in some instances might be enough for someone to say, this isn't healthy for me anymore. Like, do you get that? Like people come to you and say, it's not that I don't love my job. I just can't handle the environment. Absolutely. So there are people who cut. So there's, you know, people leave managers. They don't leave jobs. So, you know, there are a lot of people who sit in jobs every day, love what they do, happy with their pay, you know, really don't want to ruffle the feathers of anyone around them, but it is toxic. They're watching things around them that just don't make them feel comfortable. And they may not be directly bullied themselves, but they see other people treated around them that doesn't resonate well with them and they choose to leave. Again, you know, Leanna, it's all about choice, right? We all have choices. What do I want to do? Do I want to pick up and say, I have a really good skill set. I really like what I do, but because I don't like the four walls that I'm doing it in, I can find a better environment. I can find somewhere else that maybe I do feel better about coming into work every day. Because I can tell you, if you're walking into an organization every day and you feel stressed and you feel uncomfortable because of behavior that goes on around you, eventually it will lead to a lack of productivity and it will lead to a sense of anxiety of having to go in and watch this every day. When do you start, when you come to that realization that it- I like what I'm doing. I'm fine with everything else, but I don't like the confines of this of these four walls. Can you be within those four walls and should you be looking for other work at that point? You know, sometimes people are like leave and you'll find something or would you suggest to people start looking while you're in this environment or in the job before you make any rash decisions. So I think what's a common mistake that people make is they get into themselves into the situation and they flee. So they either quit because they just, like you said, they can't go in or they look, start looking for work and they walk out. What they tend to not do is sit back and say to themselves, can I actually fix the problem? Can I actually go and talk to somebody within my organization? You know, I, we spent a lot of time talking about the unemployment rate and how hard it is to find good talent and what companies are doing, whether it's games rooms and everything, mm-hmm. bending over backwards to keep their employees. Sometimes companies don't know that their employee is unhappy or that there's something that's bothering them. Maybe they haven't asked. Maybe it's never come up. But I highly encourage people before they just walk out of a job, if you can, if the, it's appropriate, if the timing and your manager allows for it, if there's not, a, it's not appropriate to go to your manager and there's somebody else within the organization in a HR capacity, then go to them and say, look, I really like it here. I love my job. I love what I do. I really feel value. I'm bringing value and I feel valued. Here's my problem. I don't know if this can be fixed. And 
again, use the resources around you, the people around you, and see if they can help you fix that problem. Maybe they didn't know. And if they didn't know, then now they can go and speak to the managers or pull you into a room with other people or get a better understanding of what's going on. Because if you're feeling this way, there might be other people too. This might be you know, a symptom of a bigger epidemic within a corporate culture that just nobody is aware of. So, you know, if you're planning on leaving anyways, and you're walking out the door vis-a-vis looking for a job or just quitting, maybe it's worth to see if I can make it a little bit better for myself by just taking the time to explain to somebody what the real problem is before I walk out the door. I don't think a lot of people step back they enough don't. To, to think that. They don't. But you know what, Leanne, if you wanted a raise in a job, if yeah, what your that. issue was, if your issue for leaving a job, we're, we're talking about a toxic environment. Okay. But and then I want to talk about asking for that raise because making the ask is so hard for people. Absolutely. And I'll show you, it's similar in the sense that, like like I said, if whether it's you're asking for a raise or you have a problem in the workforce, these are both conversations that are confrontational in nature they're frankly delivering news that the other person at the other end of the table probably doesn't want to hear Um, but that doesn't mean you don't have the right to have the conversation and I think now more than ever we really are in work environments where where people have the pulse that doesn't mean they can fix the problem that doesn't mean that the problem's going to go away but at least you've given them the know-how to say if you're not going to fix this problem I'm going I'm leaving anyways. So now I've just bought myself some time, hopefully, or I've gotten myself a severance package possibly, but at least I've tried, I've brought it to their attention so that when I go and resign, because I found another job, you're not all of a sudden faced with a situation of, well, why didn't you tell us, Leanne? Like, we didn't realize you were unhappy here. We would have moved you to another department. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, geez, really? Let's talk about that. And it's a little bit too late. Can I ask you about the asking for a promotion, and asking for a raise? Because that's really tough. And you're going to laugh at me. But like, do you know how fast time has gone on this? Really? Because I said to you an hour felt like it would take forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's go with that. Asking for a raise, asking for a promotion. How do we do this? So, you know, this is about timing. And, you know, I think usually there's a point in time where year-end review is a good time for this. Uh, Annual reviews are a good time for this. Um, And I think it usually has to be back, or I know it has to be backed up with a business case. If you're looking for a promotion or you're looking for a raise or you're asking for the company to give you something, even if it's flexibility to work from home, you've got to go in there with an argument of why you've deserved it and why you feel you deserve it going forward. And I think a part of that research is also understanding what the market value is. So if you feel that you're making 70000 and you've done your homework and you see jobs that are posted and they're posted out there for you at seventy five dollars to $80,000, and part of that um, ask for a raise is going to be, look, at, I've done my homework. Here's some data to support my ask. And it's, go- and it's got to be, re- if you're making $70,000, you are walking in asking for ninety to $100,000, we got a problem, right? Because that's a big gap and that's a big obstacle for a company to to um to come up but you know working for an organization also there's an element of hometown discount right you sit back and say i like it here there's other reasons why i want to stay here it's not all about the money but how can i get my how can i bridge the gap so that i feel like i'm in a win-win situation that's that's what any negotiation is about right the company needs to feel they've won they've got their employee they're locked in they're happy and they're being paid you know relative to the market and it's a win for the employee because they want to stay there and it was just a matter of asking for more i think when you're dealing with promotions you need to be clear what is it this what's the skill set that you want to un, you want to gain in the absence you know of gaining that promotion i think it's really critical to ask why what do i need to do in the upcoming 6 months or 12 months so that when we sit down and have this conversation again it's not about what i lack it's about what i've done Um, I think it's about going in and understanding who you're having this conversation with and when you're getting them. Are we having this conversation outside of work? Am I getting my boss at the last five minutes of the day? Am I getting them at a holiday function saying, by the way, you know about that raise we talked about six months ago? I think it's also important that you ask for a deadline. When do you think you can come back to me on this so that you're not waiting six months and all of a sudden, you know, you feel like nothing's happening and then you go look for another job. But I, I don't think there's anything wrong in this day and age to ask for a raise. But I do think if you're given one, 
it buys the company time. You you know, people could take raises and they turn around and walk out the door two weeks later. You know, if you're going to go and ask for something, make sure it's a win-win for everybody, that the company knows that they feel that they've upheld their side of the bargain, that you're also going to uphold yours. It's, it's, it's intimidating. I'll go back to the same comment I made about the interview. Mm-hmm. Mirrors can be your best friend. Before you go in for a raise, before you go in for an interview, before you go in for a promotion, stand in front of the mirror. Before I came on to CTV with you, I used to stand in front of that mirror all the time and say, okay, what do I look like? How is Leanne going to see me? <laughs> what is it, how are the viewers going to see me? It's the same thing. What do I look like? Do I have that air of confidence? What are my talking points? What are my notes? So that you're in a position to have a business conversation. When can you just realize that you're in the position that you need to put in the time? That sometimes you just need to build experience, you need to build up your resume, that this might not be the end-all, be-all job, but to be able to keep your sights set on the bigger picture, on the dream job, on where it is that you want to go. Because people, I think, still need to feel like there's something that they're, that they're aiming for. There might be, right? And I think what people are truly aiming for professionally is just progress, Right? Nobody ever wants to feel like they're stagnant. But what does, you know, what does progress mean? Does it mean that I'm constantly learning? Does it mean that I'm constantly being promoted? Does it mean that I'm constantly making more money? But, you know, Leanne, when you and I were talking about our careers prior to coming to our current place, um, people don't spend 15 years anymore. And so what it, a career really is, is a series of jobs. And each of those jobs may be two years, four years, th- three years, six years, who knows? They're not 15 years anymore. That we do know. And so what you really have to ask yourself is, what's the next step? That plan, if you would have asked me when I walked into you know, the organization I worked for previously at the age of 23, and if you would have told me 20 years later I'd be running a business, doing the same thing, competing mm-hmm. against some other players, I would have never believed it. So it takes it's a journey. Okay. And just because I know the time is running out, yep. but I want to get to this. So we're talking about when we came into these industries, we were both in our early 20s. But you right now will have people in their mid-50s who have been laid off. And Mm -hmm. now they would have been with an organization for 30-some years Mm -hmm. and have been laid off and aren't quite prepared yet or financially still need to be Mm -hmm. in the workforce. Like that's a really tough like demo of not being scared, feeling undervalued. Like I just gave this company my, you know, all of these years. Like what do you say to them who have really much been in the same place for so long and they're feeling like oh my god like fear and panic sets in I'd say th- say thank you because you'd sit back and you say to yourself oh my god thank you I got a wealth of experience I've accumulated tremendous skills and for the last 10 20 years that I have to contribute five years whatever it is to the workforce maybe it's just a different chapter but without this opportunity I don't have other opportunities and it one door closes Leanne the next one opens and I I would argue that that demo that you're describing Mm -hmm. it's such an amazing exciting time for them to be looking for work it really is because that space that we talked about the consulting the contract world there's a huge space for people who have had careers and just want to contribute in different ways it really is I could talk for hours on that demographic alone but I think there's a huge opportunity for them to still contribute to the workforce people still need so them. they shouldn't take it as the death sentence oh god no god because knows. I think a lot of them feel that way you know they're in their 50s they're tired they've raised their family like you know like they've got kids that need to go to college they've got a sandwich generation that they might be taking care of their elderly parents like that's a frightening place to be for sure and is. not not have work for sure it is but they're also sitting back and they're saying I've also they have skills you talked you touched upon new grads and how do we get upon get them into the workforce these people at least you know have that experience they have a whole career of skills to lean on their issue is how do I just brand myself for that labor market that I don't know because I've only worked at you know two maybe three companies at most for the last 40 years or 30 years how do I take my brand now that I never had to brand before because it was always people internally understood me and take that to market no problem that we can wrap up in a bow and put together and put together a nice resume those things are great that Sarah can wrap it up in a bow for you (laughs) all right but at least you have the skills and the the strength and knowledge that other people don't have okay and would you say (laughs) Veronica's looking at me going okay Sari by the way like I'm not I'm not over (laughs) what do you say to parents who have kids who are about to get into the, to the workforce or maybe aren't quite considering it yet and they don't have that title or that job or 
do you give them advice to just sit back and breathe in and not force these I don't even know what this next generation is they're not millennials anymore they're post millennials so I think who've grown up with social media Instagram like making money off of TikTok and YouTube (laughs) well and and really like TikTok to us was just a clock sound when we were growing up right Apple was just a fruit it wasn't a phone you know Blackberry was also a fruit but now it's a whole different world in terms of of what people can expect when they enter the workforce and I have a lot of parents who put a have a lot of pressure of Mm -hmm. I want my kids to do this or I need them to get into this internship or this co-op or this job but it's the same thing that I'd say to my 55 year old who was recently laid off which is this is just it's a journey it really is a journey and there's small baby steps throughout the journey and when you're a parent trying to get your kid into the workforce the first thing you have to ask yourself is are my expectations for my child what I want for them is it viable does that job exist can they feasibly get that job based on where they are and if the answer to that is yes then great let's give them the tools and show them how to interview and practice with them and review their resume and help them but if the answer to that is no that job doesn't exist in Ottawa or it doesn't exist in Toronto or we don't hire interns of that Mm -hmm. uh, first year students and we only hire interns that are third year then you we're setting our kids up to fail, right? And I think the best thing you can do to your children is let them go and experience it. Go try all different things, whether they're summer contracts or their internships or their short-term contracts for two weeks over Christmas break or introduce them to your own offices and companies if you can, but bring them in and give them a sense of responsibility and understanding of what commitment is. Oh, I could still keep talking. This is so, so <laughs> but I know I can't. So I want to just at least give people an opportunity right now. If they're struggling, yep. is it worthwhile? Is it worth the investment to talk to a professional? Like just like we have coaches and we have trainers and we have nutritionists. There is, there are people who, this is what they do. Like they do. The workforce I, is, is where you're, that's your expertise. And I think you have to remember that if you're not working right now or you're having that struggle, whether you're dealing with a recruiter or you're driving your own job search, people need you. They need to fill jobs. What's not happening is is that we're just not connecting the pieces. And so as you continue to ask yourself why, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with my process, there are people here, there are resources, there are people like myself that you can talk to along the way that will objectively look at your resume, that will talk to you about interviewing. I mean, I just had a conversation with somebody candidly the other day about their attire in an interview. You did a great interview, but this was your attire. I mean, those are conversations that we want everyone to win a job. Everybody wants to end up going down the right path. So use whatever tools you can and reach out to whatever resources are at your fingertips to just get feedback. Where can people find more information on you? They can go to my website at recruitinginmotion.com. You can find me on LinkedIn under Sari Cantor. And may I suggest, if you're connecting with Sari on LinkedIn, make sure to use the (laughs) message and send her a quick note to say, Hi, Sari, I listened to the podcast with Leanne and I thought I would reach out and ask you some questions. Absolutely. And I respond to everybody. Like like I said, whatever I could do to help somebody's journey um, or just give them some sound advice or maybe even help them find a job is always a pleasure. S A R I. C-A-N-T-O-R, Sari Cantor. You're, let's see what happens on your LinkedIn account. <laughs> I want to be able to thank you so much. I, I really hope, um, especially for those people kickstarting or feeling stressed or anxious or nothing's out there. I love it. We just haven't found the right connection. Absolutely. It's out there. It's waiting for you. That dream job, everything is waiting for you, that opportunity. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast, Living Your Life with Leanne Lang. So you got to tell people about it. You got to tell your friends, oh my God, I heard this. It was awesome. You got to check out this episode because you've got like episode zero to 107, I think at this point. So that's your that's your cue right there. And please subscribe. The subscriptions really help in terms of getting it noticed on all of the different platforms. And of course, you can find the podcast on every single platform where you find your podcasts. Hoping everyone has a fantastic day and we'll see you back here next week. <laughs>